So welcome, but it's this latest GCSE video on 162 Maths, and in this video we'll be going through the AQA GCSE Maths Foundation paper of November 2019, paper 1, which is an on-calculator, and working through the answers. Now we'll put the grade boundaries in the description below, so once you've completed the paper and you've marked it, you can see what grade you would have got for this singular paper. So let's get started on this November 2019 Foundation GCSE paper 1, which is an on-calculator. Now you tend to find that the very first questions of all of the GCSE papers tend to be multiple choice. doesn't mean that you need to guess at the papers, just means that they should relatively be relatively simple and should be relatively quick to answer. So the first question says circle the value of the digit 9 in this number. Now with this question, the 9, you want to ask yourself what does that represent? Well it represents a tenth. How do I represent a tenth as a fraction? Well it's going to be 1 over 10. So 9 tenths is going to be our third option. Question two it relates to solving equations, so we want to make x a subject. So here I've got x equals 3x equals 6. So I take the 3 over to the other side by dividing, and so 6 divided by 3 is 2, so it's going to be our second option. Question three, circle the correct statement. So again, here we're introducing inequalities. So because we've got a mixture of decimals and fractions, what you want to do is convert it so that they're both the same. Now, personally speaking, I'll definitely convert the fractions into decimals. So here I've got 0 0.3 as 0.25, sorry, quarter is 0 0.25, 0 0.3 is equal to 0 0.25, 0 0.3 is greater or equal to 0 0.25, and 0 0.3 is less than uh, 0.25. So in terms of this, let's just have a look. I've noticed that what I was reading out was not what I was writing down. So let's have a look at what these means. Now, in terms of inequalities, how I always remember it is that the arrow always points at the smaller number. So if the arrow is pointing at the smaller number, is this going to be true? Well, the first one, yes, because obviously 0 0.25 is smaller. The second one is wrong. The third one is wrong because the arrow is pointing at the bigger number. And again, the same for the last one. So the correct option here is the first option. Now scrolling down to question four. It says circle the number that is closest to the square root of 50. Now for this, what you need to do is find, write down your square number. So here we've got 1, 4, uh, 9, 16, 25, 36, and 49 and 64 until we get to a number that's above 50. Now square root of 49 is 7 and the square root of 8, 64 is 8. So we're looking for which one is it going to be closest to. Now 50, is it closest to 49 or is it close to 64? Well it's closer to 49 which is the square root of 7 so 7 is our correct answer. Now for question 5 there's so many different ways in which you can do this. Now it is worth three marks. So there's several ways you could do it. The most popular ways are probably doing it more the column method where you're working your answer out like this. The other way could be the grid method where you've got 70 and you've got 6 and you're doing 20 and 4. And then you've got let's say like the Elizabethan way we're using let's say diagonals. So again if you have absolutely no idea what I'm talking about there is a method where you have diagonal lines going through and you can answer that way. You can use whatever method you want. As long as the answer is correct and as long as you're showing a mathematically sound method, then that is going to be absolutely fine. Now for me, I'm just going to go on to using the two common methods. So here I've got 7 times 2, which is 14, with two zeros. 7 times 4, which is 28, and I've got one zero. 2 times 6, which is 12, and I've got one zero. And 6 times 4, which is 24. Now from this, all I've then got to do is add all of those numbers up in which I get 4, 12, 5, 7, 8 and 1. So my final answer is 1, 8, 2, 4. Now if I quickly just do the column method, so here we've got 4 times 6 which is 24, carry the 2, 4 times 7 is 20, 28 plus the 2 is 30, then add a 0, 2 times 6 is 12, and I add the 1, and 2 times 7 is 14, plus 1 is 15. So from this, all I then do is add them up, so I've got two, 4, 2, 8, 1, and I, you can see here I get the same answer as I did before. So again, if you want to go for any method you want, then that's be perfect, but for 3 marks it is really important that you do show your working out. 
So now moving on to question six, which looks at composite bar chart. So the composite bar chart shows the number of students in some classes. And we've got boys, girls, the so boys are highlighted in dark gray, girls in light gray. And the number of students is going along the top to so the frequency and we've got subjects going across the bottom. Now the next question, the question 6a says, how many boys are there in the physics class? So what we're looking for is how many, how tall, uh, what the frequency is for the dark grey in physics. And that is going to be 8. So we're just going to write an 8 in that box there. Next question says, how many girls are there in the English class? So again, I'm counting how many are in the light grey. So again, you can either count the individual boxes if you feel that's more comfortable, just making sure that you are careful. But here I can see that I'm going from 13 all the way up to 29. And 29 take away 13 is going to give me an answer of 16. Now there are one mark, so it's just a case of reading off, so I don't need to write down any working out. Just the correct answer would be absolutely fine. And then question 6c says, which two classes have the same total of students? Well, for this, all we need to do is just see which two bars are the same height in total, and that is going to be physics and art. Now, if I rotate it all the way around, then that I'd still get four marks for it. Now, we've not finished this question because the question says, in history class, there are 18 students. The number of girls equals the number of boys. Show this num this information on the bar chart. So, in terms of the information I've been given, the total height is going to be. 18 and there's I need to split the number of boys and girls by two so I'm going to have nine boys and nine girls so going back to my chart here now with a bar chart we need to make sure it's equally spaced so I'm going to go for one single bar I'm just going to label that history and we're going all the way up to 18 so 18 is just too shy of that 20 block it's just there and again, I should be using a ruler, but again, just for the purpose of speed, I'm just going to do it like this. And then we're going 9 for the boys, which should give me a nice even split with the girls. And then all I then need to do is shade in, and so let's get a dark grey. Just shade that in. Now again, you're not going to get any, any extra marks for your colouring skills. Uh, but you want to try and keep it in the lines and make sure that you have used a ruler for this. And let's just see, have I got a dark grey? I just about have shade that in. The most important thing is, is that in the bar you can see that it goes all the way up to 18 and you've got a horizontal line going through 9. And that should be absolutely fine for that question. So I'm moving on to question 7. So this is looking at decimal division. Now decimal division is done in the exact same way as normal division. The difference is we just need to make sure that we put our decimal point on top of the bus stop in the same position. So here I've got 6 divided by 1, which is 0, so I carry the 1. 6 is into 18, goes 3, and no remainder, and 6 goes into 6 once, so the final answer is 0 0.31. Now for question B, now again this could be done in several different ways. It's only worth one mark, so you're really going to get the full answer. So for here, how I'd like to teach this is just doing 4 times 2. And what I've done is I've moved the decimal point one place to the right and one place to the right there. 4 times 2 is 8. So now what I need to do is move the decimal point two places back in the left direction. So if I've got 8, my decimal point is here, moving it two places. So the decimal point goes there. So then my final answer is going to be 0 0.08. Moving on to question 8. What we've got here is here are four cards. Choose two cards, uh, two cards to make the answer to this calculation a whole number. Uh, include the answer in your calculation. So what we're wanting to do is just end up with a whole number. Now how do we end up with a whole number? Is several ways. Um, we can just do trial and error. But what you want to try and do is, I would say, think about it as money. So think about this as eight pounds sixty. Think as this as twenty-seven pence. And shall we put that? pence sign there so let's just get rid of that. Think of the 6.3 as £6.30 and think of the last one as 40 pence. I want to add two amounts so that I don't have any pence. So for this one the answer is going to be 8.6 and 0 0.4 and that's going to equal 9 and I would say that's the only combination that you can have for this. 
Now again, if you wrote 0 0.4, 8 0.6 in the other direction, then that would be absolutely fine. For question 8b it says choose, choose two cards to make the answer to the calculation as large as possible. Include the answer in the calculation. Now because we're subtracting to get the biggest answer, which is what we're wanting, the first number needs to be the largest possible number and the second number needs to be the smallest. So if I go back to having a look at what my list of numbers were, I want to pick the biggest out of those three, those four numbers, which is 8.6. And I want to subtract the smallest amount, which is 0 0.27. And then all I then need to do is do the subtraction. Now, if you are going to do the subtraction, make sure that the decimal point goes in exactly in sort of columns and we add the zero from there. Now again, it's several ways in which you can do this. If you treat it as eight pounds six in 20, 27 pence, you'll probably able to do this question in your head in which we get the answer of 8.33. So question nine says that Jenny buys five rulers and two pens. She works out how much she must uh, she should pay. The price of rulers and pens are later stated above. Jenny's total is wrong. What mistake has she made? Include the correct total in your answer. Now here we want to check is 5 times 85 £4.25, so let's just do double check, so let's have a look. So 85 times 5, so 5 times 5 is 25, 5 times 8 is 40, plus 2 is that, so yes she's correct, so that amount is correct. Now I can see straight away without having to work it out that two pounds, 2 times £3.50 is not £6.10, so I'm guessing that's where the mistake is, so 2 times £3.50 is not £6.10, it's £7. And so then our correct total is going to be £4.25 plus £7, which gives us a total of £11.25. Now in terms of two marks, one mark will be for the mistake that she's made. Now would you be allowed to say that she's not written 85 pence in uh, pounds? Because obviously there's going to be some issues there. I would say that that is going to be not valid. So again, sum it along the lines of that 250 pences don't make 10 pence. That could be, that will be allowed. Um, you may also get allowed for sticking a pence in there, but I strongly would not recommend it. Try and only have one unit of of money when you write down your answers um, but yeah anything along those lines would be absolutely fine so moving on to question 10 it says that here are three calculations a b and c uh, put the calculations in order start with the calculation of the smallest answer you must show your answer in each calculation so what we need to do is we need to work these numbers out so in terms of a let's get a pen not writing with the rubber so a so i've got one times two which is 2 and then I can just add the number of zeros. So I've got 2 plus 4, so that's 6 zeros. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Now 1 million, so for B, if I just write it on the side, 1 million is 6 zeros. So if I have half um, 1 million, I'm going to end up with half a million, so that's going to be 500,000. So B equals 500. And then C, 4 times 100,000, well 4 times 1 is 4, and then I'm just going to end up with 5 zeros. Five. So in terms of the smallest, well the smallest looking at this is going to be C, then it's B, and then it's A. And not appropriate use of letters there, but we carry on. Now it is important that you do show you working out, so again, in terms of working, you'd show uh, some effort to work out what A is, so that would get you one mark, one mark for working out what B is or C is, and then one mark for writing down the correct order, I would say. You may just get one mark for working out what one of the amounts are, but it does say that you must show your answer to each calculation, so I would more likely to say that the two marks would come from doing that, and then one mark for writing C, B, A in that order. Now for question 11, it says that in a raffle, 200 tickets are sold, the tickets are either red or blue, a winning ticket is picked at random, what is the probability that the winning ticket is green? Well, for that, well there aren't any green tickets, so it's going to be zero, or you could write it as zero um, percent, which I, again, I personally don't like writing um, fraction uh, probabilities as percentages unless it specifically requires it, so zero is the answer you're looking for. 
Question 11b, it says that 79 children, 80 women buy one ticket, men buy the rest of the tickets. Work out the probability that a man buys the winning ticket. So for this, what we need to do is work out the total of male purchases. And how do we do that? Well, there's 200 tickets. Um, let me just get rid of that second S. So we've got 200 tickets. So we've got 200 minus 90 minus 79. And if I work that out, I'm doing 200 minus 79 minus 90. I get an answer of 31. So 31 male tickets are purchased. Then to work out the probability, well, it's simply going to be 31 over the total number of tickets which was 200 and then I just need to see does that simplify no so then that there is my final answer now if you wanted to give it as a decimal but because it's a non-calculator again I wouldn't recommend it I would leave it as a fraction as the most simplest answer particularly if you're using if you're practicing this don't use a calculator just leave it as a fraction it's so much easier so question 12 says that college has a total of 105 teachers 19 more female teachers than male teachers what proportion of teachers are female now again there are several ways in which we can do this so if we said that there are x number of male teachers then the 50, the, as it says, states here that there are 19, so the male teachers are going to be, um, so the female, teachers will be, as there's 19 more, is going to equal x plus 19. Now, from this, what we then need to do is to work out how many there are, well, we know that there's, how many there are in total. So here we've got that x plus x plus 19 equals 105. Now if I then go on to write this out, so I get 2x plus 19 equals 105. And I get 2x equals 105 take away 19. So 105 take away 19 is 86. And so x equals 43. So that means that there are 43 male teachers and there's going to be 43 plus 19 which is 62 female teachers so right in the proportion of male teachers well that's going to be 43 oh, the proportion of female teachers so it's a good job in reading the question it's going to be uh, 62 over 105 and then just need to check does that simplify um, I'm going to say no now for question 13 it says by rounding each number to nearest 10 estimate the value of 262 divided by 19.8 so we're going to round each number up to nearest 10 so 262 rounded is going to be 260 and 19.8 the nearest 10 is 20 but what I'm doing is I'm doing 260 divided by 20 which if I cancel the zeros I've then got 26 divided by 2 which is 13 in terms of where you get marks, you get marks for showing 260 and 20 and then doing the division to give you 13. Now for question 14, um, this one says that we just need to read it carefully. It says A, B, E, F and A, C, D, F are rectangles. A to F is 10 centimetres. So let's just label this up. So that's 10 centimetres. A to B is 2 centimetres and B to C is 4 centimetres. Now the question is saying work out the perimeter of the ratio of the perimeter of ABEF and the perimeter of ACDF. So here in terms of the perimeter of ABEF, which is the small thin rectangle, so if I just highlight that in blue, then that there is going to be 10 plus 2 plus 10 plus 2 which is 24 centimeters then if I then work out the perimeter of the next rectangle which is ACDF which is ACDF which is a big rectangle 
Again, I'm going to be adding 10 plus 6 plus 10 plus 6, which gives me an answer of 32 centimeters. Now, to give it as a ratio, I need to do the ABEF, which is our blue one, so that's 24, to the ratio of our second one, which is 32, and then I just then need to simplify this ratio. Now, to simplify this ratio, all I then need to do is just simply divide both numbers by 8, in which I've got 8, uh, sorry, 3. And so let's just say what I'm doing. So I'm dividing by 8, divided by 8, in which I get the ratio of 3 to 4. Now, moving on to question 15, it says ADB and CD are straight lines. The angle of ADC equals 5 times the size of CDB work out the angle of ADC. So if we call this smaller angle X, then what the question is telling me is that this angle here is five times the size. So if this small angle is X, then this angle here is gonna be five X. Now, what do we know about angles on a straight line? Well, they add up to 180, so that means that five X plus one X equals 180. So six X equals 180. So if I divide by six, I get x equals 30. So each x, and the question is asking me to work out the angle of ADC. So if x equals 30, 5x is going to be 5 lots of that, which is 150. So the answer is 150 degrees. Then working out with question 16, it says circle the value that's 5 cubed. Well, 5 cubed means 5 times 5 times 5. And 5 times 5 is 25. So 25 times 5 is 125. Then looking at question 17, it says draw the graph of y equals 3x minus 1 for the values of minus 1 and 3. Now let me just zoom out so you can see what we're doing for this particular question. Oh, we're making it disappear. That's not helpful. Let's just go back to where we were. There we go. Now, just so that we're not so what we need to plot is we need to plot 3x minus 1. Now to do this what we need to do is create a table of values. Now for this what you want to try and do is pick three relatively small numbers that appear on your x-axis. So I'm going to go for 0, 1, 2. Now for this what you want to do is just substitute these x numbers into our formula. So to find this y value for the first one I'm going to do 3 times 0 take away 1 to find and which is going to give me minus 1. For the second one, when x equals 1, I'm going to do 3 times 1. Let's not do it this way. Let's write it properly. So here I'm going to do 3 times 1, which is 3. Take away 1, which is 2. And then for my third value, I'm going to do 3 times 2, which is 6. Take away 1, which is 5. So now what I want to do is I want to plot these coordinates. So I'm going to plot 0 minus 1. I'm going to plot 1, 2, and 2, 5. So 0 minus 1 is here. 1, 2 is there. And 2, 5 is there. Now what you should find is that all of those three points should make a straight line. So then with a ruler, and it is important that you do join these dots up, because you then want to draw a line. Now ideally what you want is you want this line to cut the axes. Make sure it doesn't just cut through the three points you've labelled, you want it to go through all of them. Again, a bit fiddly doing it on this computer, but I think that's probably the best I'm going to get. But your line, straight line, should go through those coordinates correctly. Let's zoom back in so we can see what the questions are. And so for question 18, it says that Mo played 30 games of chess. He won 18 of these games. What fraction of games did he win? Give your answer in its simplest form. It's worth two marks. So the first one we've got 18 is 18 out of 30. So writing that as a fraction would get me one mark, but I then need to simplify it. What number goes into both 18 and 30? That's going to be 6. So I've got 3 and 10. So the answer then is 3 tenths. And it's important that you don't write it 0 0.3 because the question does ask us to write it as a fraction. The question then says he played 20 games more and he won 64% of all the games. How many of the 20 games did he win? Now this one's worth three marks and a bit more problem solving. So the fact that he's played 20 games more means that in total he's played 
50 games. Now, if he's won 64%, what I need to do is I need to work out what 64% of 50 is. Now, half of 64, well, basically from this, I can just flip this. So 64% of 50 is the same as 50% of 64. Now, 50% 64. of 64 is just half, which is 32. So the total number of winnings he's made is 32 wins in total. Now it says that in the first 30 games he's won 18, so how many more of 18 to 32, well how many more wins did he get in those extra games? Well it's going to be 32 take away 18, and 32 take away 18 gives me an answer of 14, so the answer there is 14. Now looking at question 19a it says that in a field the number of sheep to the number of cows is 10 to 3. Zach says that there are 10 sheep in the field. Give a reason why Zach could be wrong. Well when it comes to ratios, ratios are exactly like fractions so that they can be simplified. So the reason why Zach could be wrong is because the ratio may have been simplified. And there are other couple of reasons that you could have, but I would say that's probably going to be the most recent. So you could say that, um, again, there might be 20 sheep. The number of sheep could be any multiple of 10. The ratio may have been simplified, as I've stated, and the number in the ratio does not have to be the actual numbers. So anything along those comments would get you the one mark. Well, question 19b, it says that in a different field, the number of goats to the number of pigs is 13 to 4. Priya says that there are three times as many goats as there are pigs. Is she correct? Well, in terms of her reasons for this, well, the question is going to be yes. And the reason for this is because if we, as you can see with ratios, this is going to be in its simplest form. So here, if I did four times three, which is 12, and 12 is less than 13, so obviously it's always going to be more than three times. So whatever the number of pigs are, you're going to be dividing it by four times it by 13. That will always give you an answer that's going to be more than three times because 13 is, uh, sorry, 13 is for more than uh, three times bigger as four. So something along those lines would be absolutely fine for you to write. So let's just write that down. So here we can say that 13 is more than three times bigger. Than so again, sum it along those lines would be absolutely fine. And then moving on to question 20, it says that an ordinary die is rolled and the probability of getting A is 5, 6, which the current statements is true about event A. So here we're looking at that the number of rolls uh, the number rolled is even well that's not going to be true because if you're rolling an ordinary die that's going to be have a probability of a half and that's not great the number rolled is greater than one and that's going to be true uh, because obviously we're looking at five numbers the number rolled is less than five well again the numbers that are less than five is four three two one so that's four out of six which is not right and the number rolled is prime again well that's wrong because there's three prime numbers in on an ordinary die so that's going to be incorrect as well so there's only one correct answer which is the second option question 21 we've got a double sided equation so again this could be done in several ways personally I would always get rid of the smallest number of x so let's just do just that so here I end up with 6x plus 7 equals 10 I take the 7 over to the other side so I've got 6x equals 3 and then I take the 6 over to the side by dividing in which I end up with a half or you could write it as 3 over 6, or you can write it as 0 0.5, and that would get you full marks. So looking at question 22, it says, in a right angle triangle, the smallest angle to the largest angle is 2 to 5. Work out the three angles of this triangle. Now, without drawing a diagram, this question is pretty tricky. So let's start by drawing a right angle triangle. Like so. Now the common mis mis mistake that people make is obviously this angle is going to be 90 degrees so we know that one angle is going to be 90. The question is which angle is going to be the biggest? Now looking at my diagram you might think well this angle is going to be the biggest and this one at the top is going to be the smallest. 
However, you're going to be wrong because the biggest angle is actually 90 degrees. This is the biggest angle because anything bigger than that is going to be an, an obtuse angle, which you can't, will never find in a right angle triangle. So here, the biggest triangle, the biggest angle is nine parts. So 90 degrees equals five parts. So then one part, ah, let's just get rid of that one on the other side. So one part is going to be 90 divided by 5 and how many 90s go how many 5s go into 90 well that's going to be 18 so to when work out what the smallest angle is which i'm going to say is the blue one which is our smallest that's going to be two lots of 18 which is 36 degrees then to work out our final angle so this little green angle here all i need to do is do 180 minus 90 minus 36 well for this I could do the subtraction it's not a problem or I could just find out what do we need to add to 36 to make 90 and that is going to be 54 degrees now if you wrote those angles in any other order that should get you with the correct full marks so as long as you've got 90 36 and 54 it's all good question 23 says which of the following is discrete data circle this now discrete data if we just have a little description of what discrete data is is exact values so it can only be exact certain numbers so it can only be certain numbers within a given range so it can only be certain numbers so the length of an arm length can be measured in any number um, so we can depending on the accuracy of your ruler you could go to let's say it could be 27.267829 centimeters so again it's not going to be that the height of a door again is going to be could be anything uh, how tall it could be. again looking at the so accuracy of your length measurement is not going to be true number of pets well you can't have you can only have a certain number and it can only be whole numbers so because you can't have 0.3 of a pet um, so I'm going to say with a huge amount of certainty going through this it's going to be the number of pets also unless you're living in a zoo um, you're not going to have like 3,000 pets so it would be within all yours you might have pet, pet control around your house but again you're only going to have a certain number of pets within a given range and that those numbers need to be whole numbers they can't be decimals can't be negatives um, otherwise you might be going to jail and also the mass of sugar again you can have decimal weights so again that's not going to be true so our correct answer here is the number of pets which is quite a nice question saying it's question 23 Question 24a, it says here are two triangles P and Q and the question saying that the we're going from P to Q and the question saying here is a statement transformation that maps P to Q is a reflection in the line of X equals minus one and we need to make one criticism of this now here the actual reflection line is here so basically the, re the, the well, one criticism is that the reflection line is wrong Or incorrect now there are several things in which you can say for this particular question um, so anything along the lines of that uh, it's a wrong line that's been given which is what we stated the actual correct line should be y equals minus 1 not x equals minus 1 but other acceptable answers can see can say that uh, the given reflection line image would be the set in the second quadrant so in other words in the one on the other side so this is this here would be our second quadrant um, you can say that the line that's given is vertical when you want a horizontal line so that would be fine given you need to you could either give coordinates of where the reflection is and how it doesn't work but I would say the most common statement that's going to be made is that reflection line is incorrect and that it should be x equals minus 1 for question 24b it says here are two shapes C and D here is a statement a transformation that maps c to d so we're going from this to this uh, is a rotation of 90 degrees anti-clockwise make one criticism now if you revise rotation and you're describing the rotation you should know that there are a couple of bits that you need to know not only do we need to know what the transformation is which is rotation we also need to know 90 degrees we also need to know the anti-clockwise but one thing we are missing is the center of rotation which in this case is zero zero and I would say that that there is probably the most common answer that you could get but again there are several statements you can make that could give you the full marks but I would say go for that one 
and you'll be absolutely fine. Um, coming to near the end of the paper, so question 25a says the geometric progression starts for 16 and we need to work out what the next term is. Now with a geometric progression, this is where you're multiplying, not adding, from one number to get to the next. So you think to yourself, okay, well, what, am I, what do I need to multiply 4 to get 16? Well, I need to times that by 4. So then what I need to do to work out the next term is 16 times 4, which gives me the answer of 64. Now the next term in terms of Fibonacci sequence, this is where you are adding the previous two numbers to get the new number. So to get this next number, what I need to do is add 3 plus minus 8, and 3 plus minus 8 gives me minus 5. And then to work out the next number, so here I've got, if I just write minus 5, so to find the next number I then need to add these two numbers together, so it's going to be minus 8 plus minus 5, which then becomes minus 8 minus 5, which is minus 13. And then moving on to our next question. Uh, it says, given that a times 60 equals b, work out the value of 4b times a. Now for this, what we need to do is just substitute this for b. Now another way of writing that is 60a. So if I do that, so instead of writing, so I've got 4 times 60a over a. If I simplify the top, I just multiply the numbers with the numbers, so that gives me 240a over a. And as I've got a at the top, a at the bottom, it just cancels out, so my answer is 240. Then looking at question 27, it says write 27 times 3 to the power 2 um, to the power of 7 as a single power of 3. Now what we need to do here is we'll look at indices. Now I can write 27 as a power of 3, and how many 3s do I need to multiply to get 27? Well, 3 times 3 gives me 9, times 3 is 27, so it's 3 cubed. So how I can write this question is 3 to the power of 3. Now when we've got brackets, what do we do to the powers? Well, we multiply them. So it's 3 to the power of 3 times 3 to the power of 14. When we're multiplying, what do we do to the powers? Well, we simply add them, giving me my final answer of 3 to the power of 17. And looking at the next question, question 28 says, here are two solids. We've got a cylinder with a radius of 4 and height of 10, and we've got a hemisphere of radius of 6, and it's got our formula here. Now the question is saying, which solid has the greater volume? Now what I'm going to try and do is just zoom out, so we've got both of these two. So what I need to do is work out the volume of both of these two shapes. Now in this, what we've got to do for the cylinder, which we formerly we've not been given, so it's something you're going to need to remember, well, the volume of a cylinder is pi to a times, or, well, pi r squared times h. So substituting the numbers in, I get v equals pi times the radius, which is 4 squared, times h, which is 10. Now, if I just simplify that, I get v equals pi times 16 times 10. So that gives me v equals 160 pi. Now, for the hemisphere, I'm going to use the formula. So V equals 2 thirds times pi times the radius cubed. So for this, what I need to do is I've got V equals, and it's going to be 2 times pi times 6 cubed over 3. And then simplifying that, I get 2 times pi. Now 6 cubed is 216 um, divided by 2, uh, but divided by 3 rather. And oh, let's just change that color. There we go. And then all we then need to do is simplify that thing. So here we've got 2 times 216 is going to be 432 pi divided by 3. And 432 divided by 3 equals 144 pi. Now, if you're not sure how I've got that, all you just need to do is bus stop and you get 140. So, and now, so in terms of that, then what we need to do is just compare these two volumes. So, which is going to give me the bigger answer? Well, it's going to be the volume of the cylinder. So, here in this, what we then say is the volume of the cylinder. Now, all of the working out that I've done up there needs to be written in this space here. And then moving on to uh, our latter parts of the question. So here, let's just 
zoom in. Now these questions are going to be like the starting questions on the higher paper. So it then says that Sag makes rose pink paint and cherry pink paint. He mixes the red paint with the white paint as shown. He makes 60 litres of the rose paint. Uh, to this rose paint he then adds 80 litres of red paint and 28 litres of white paint. He now has made cherry, has, has he now made cherry pink paint and we must show our working out for this. So for this what we need to do is work out how much red and white paint he has used to make the rose pink paint. So let's just work with this and we're going to use for this. So here what we need to do is we've got 60 litres and we need to share it in the ratio of 1 to 2. So I've got 60 litres and I've got the ratio of 1 to 2. So here 1 plus 2 is 3, 60 divided by 3 is 20. So here in terms of the red and white I've got 1 times 20 which is 20 and 2 times 20 which is 40. So this is for the cherry, the rose pink sorry. Now what we've then done is we then need to add 80 litres of red, so we need to add 80 to this number and we need to add 28 to this here, uh, to the number of white litres. So in terms of the total litres, I've got 100 litres to 68 litres. Now is that in the ratio of 43? Well one way to check is to say well we can simplify this, so if I simplify this ratio I'm going to get fit so this simplified is going to give me 50 to 32 25 to 16 and again it's really difficult to compare what these two ratios are what well, I can see straight away that they're not going to simplify so the question is going to be no and we just then need to give our reason now one way of looking at it is that Saj has a total of 168 litres in which 100 is red and 68 is white. Now he then needs so to make uh, 168 litres of cherry pink he's going to need so in terms of the red paint, well it's going to need 168 divided by 7 times by 4. Uh, now again you don't probably need, don't need to go in this amount of detail, but it certainly would make sense. And again you just need to do what you need to do. So it's going to need 96 litres of red paint. And then for white, well it's going to be 168 minus 96 which gives you an answer of 72. So comparing this to this, he's going to have enough red paint, which is fine, but he's not going to have enough, uh, so he's not going to have enough of red paint, but he is going to have enough of the white paint. So again here, another statement says it doesn't have enough red paint. And there we go. And then moving on to our next question, which is question 30, so our penultimate question, which is standard form. And we need to do 2 times 10 to the power 14 divided by 8 times 10 to the power 9. So for this, what we need to do is we need to split the fraction up. So we need to work out what eight, 2 divided by 8 is, which is 0 0.25, which is just a quarter. And then we need to do 10 to the power 14 divided by 10 to the power 9, in which we take away the powers, which gives me 10 to the power 5. Now looking at this, I've got 0 0.25 times 10 to the power 5, but that's not in standard form. If I need to, I need to make this number bigger, so therefore I need to make the power smaller. So it's going to be 2.5 times 10 to the power of 6. That's the final answer. Then for question 30, uh, it says 6200.07 equals 6.2 times um, 10 to the power C and 7 times 10 to the power D. Now 6000. 200.07 is done by having 6200 plus 0 0.07. Now this in standard form is going to be 6.2 times 10 to the power of 3 and this is going to be 7 times 10 to the power of minus 2 and that there gives me my values of C and D. So this is C 
this is d, so c equals 3 and d equals minus 2. And then looking at our last question, question 31, it says which two statements are true? So this is looking at the topic of indirect and direct proportion. And so finally, for this particular question, the boxes that you need to tick are going to be the second one and the third one. Because again, remembering knowing the topic of how to set up your um, thingy, so let's just go through it. So this statement is V is directly proportional to H which gives me V equals KH, which is, as you can see, is not what we've got there. V is inversely proportional to H, which then becomes V equals K over H, which is what we've got. V is directly proportional to one over uh, H, which again gives me the exact same thing. So again, that's gonna give me V equals K over H. And V is inversely proportional to 1 over 1 over h so that's going to be 1 over 1 over h which is just going to give me v is equal to h which is wrong so that's where I, our first two options are there and we've come to the end of the paper now we'll put the grade boundaries of this paper alone in the description below for you to see what you would have got once you've completed your paper